Hi, my name is Sarah Robinson. I'm an epidemiologist here with the state of Maine, and I am going to talk to you today about ticks and the tick-borne diseases that they can carry here in Maine. The things we're going to talk about during the presentation today include tick biology and ecology, Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases in Maine, and we are going to end with prevention. First up, there are about 15 different species of ticks that can be found here in Maine. There are two that are by far the most common that we see, and that's the deer tick and the dog tick. But as you can see, there are several other options. A lot of these ticks are very specialized in what they feed on. So you can see there's the rabbit tick, the bird tick, um, which is why humans don't come into con contact with them as often. So to start out with, we're going to talk about Ixodes scapularis. This is also known as the deer tick or the black-legged tick. And this is the tick of most concern for us here in Maine, mainly because this is the tick that carries diseases. So this tick can carry anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and Lyme disease. This tick can be found any time that the temperature is above freezing, but during the summer months is when the nymphal stage is out, and that stage is most commonly blamed for cases of Lyme disease because they are very, very small and they are hard to find. And Ixodes scapularis ticks tend to prefer brushy, wooded areas. The second most common type of tick we have here in Maine is Dermacenter variabilis, also known as the dog tick. Dermacenter variabilis either have a white dot uh, behind their head. The little shield behind their head is called the scutum. So on a dog tick, it's either white or it has white racing stripes. In the summer, if you find a very large tick, that's probably a dog tick. That's when the adult dog ticks can be found. And dog ticks tend to like more open habitats than deer ticks. So how do you tell the difference between a deer tick and a dog tick? The number one answer I usually get is size, but that is not always true. So this, sh this slide shows you the difference in sizes between deer ticks and dog ticks. But the main way to tell the difference between the two ticks is by the scutum. So that's the little shield behind the back of their head. And as you can see in this slide, that no matter what size the tick is or how fully engorged it is, you can always see that scutum. So on the top, even that fully engorged deer tick, you can see that dark brown spot behind their head, whereas the dog ticks, you can still see that the scutum has white around it. So ticks have a two-year life cycle. They start out as eggs. Um, they hatch into larvae, and that's when they take their first blood meal. Um, often that is when a tick becomes infected with Lyme disease or another potential bacteria or parasite. Um, those live for about a year where they then turn into nymphs, and nymphs take another blood meal, and that is when the risk of infection is greatest for humans. That's in the late spring and summer, that's when the nymphs are out, and again, it's because these ticks are very, very small and they're very hard to see. So after the nymphs come the adult stage, and the adults take one final blood meal, and then they, the female eggs, those are or the female ticks, which are the ones more likely to be feeding on blood are going to lay their eggs, and that is the end of their life cycle. So this is a, a real-life tick, an example of how small a tick can be. So as you can see on the left, that's the head of a pencil, and that is a tick that has bitten. So unfortunately for us, ticks are really good at what they do. They are very well adapted to their lifestyle. So first off, they have this barbed hypostome. The hypostome is their mouth parts. It's in this this picture labeled A, it's what is highlighted as green. So it's barbed, so when they bite into you, those little claws help them stay in you so they don't fall out. Um, ticks secrete an anesthesia and an anticoagulant when they're biting, which means that you won't feel it and your blood won't clot. So they can happily feed on you. The ticks will stay on you until they're full. For an adult tick, that's about seven days. Uh, the good news, if there's any good news about ticks, is that to transmit the Lyme bacterium, ticks must feed for at least 24 hours, usually more than 36 hours. And this is pure biology. A tick has to intake blood into their gut, and their gut, when the blood reaches their gut, it causes a protein transformation, which then allows the bacteria to um, migrate to their salivary glands, which then becomes injected into you while they're feeding. So. It takes the, that amount of time for the protein change to happen and for the bacteria to migrate back up into the tick salivary glands. So unfortunately for us here in Maine, tick distribution has expanded. We've partnered with Maine Medical Center Research Institute for a long time, and they've had a deer tick submission program from 1989 to 2013. So you can see on the map in the left, this was 1989 to 1994. Most of the ticks were found in the southern counties and along the coastline. 
but if you look at the map on the right, you can see that the range of ticks has expanded greatly, and ticks are now being found in all 16 counties. MMCRI has also provided us information on the, the habitat and the life stages of ticks. So deer ticks are more likely to be in their adult stage during the early spring months and then the fall months. So we are currently, today is April 20th and it is week 16. So we are currently in the early spring months, um, whereas the nymphs tend to come out during the summer months. So June, July, and August is by far when you're going to see more of the nymphal life stage. So knowing a little bit about ticks can help us avoid them. First off, knowing about their habitats can help us take caution when we're in their habitat. So there's some habitat that's good for ticks, um, particularly deer, deer ticks, like shrubbery and they like forests. They like that brushy leaf litter kind of covered sorts of areas. That's good habitat for them. That's where they can survive, they can find meals, and they can be protected. There's some unfavorable habitat for ticks. This wide open space is not good for ticks. Ticks are very, very susceptible to drying. And so this much sun exposure is bad for them. They also don't really like the wind. And so having this wide open space, this is going to be an area where you won't find many ticks. So by far the most common disease or bacteria that ticks can carry is Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. There are some early symptoms of Lyme disease. And then if the Lyme bacteria spread, it can cause some disseminated manifestations. So the most common early manifestation of Lyme disease is this bullseye rash. You can see a picture down in the corner. It tends to be red in the middle with a centrally clearing area and then red again on the outside, so it looks like a bullseye. This is the typical rash. Not all rashes look like this, but a lot of them do. The other early manifestations of Lyme um, are very vague. They're similar to flu-like symptoms, so muscle and joint pain, fatigue, chills, fever, and headache. Flu is not that common during the summer months, so if you start to have flu-like symptoms during the summer months, you should consider vector-borne disease and speak to your physician. If Lyme gets into other systems, it can cause some disseminated manifestations. The most common of this is arthritis. Um, arthritis is in with brief recurring attacks, and Lyme disease tends to like the larger weight-bearing joints. So a lot of times you hear about arthritis in the knees and in the hips. Lyme disease can also cause meningitis and cranial neuritis, such as Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is when one half of your face droops. It can also cause encephalitis and rarely second or third degree atrioventricular blocks, so cardiovascular symptoms. So unfortunately for us, we are in a prime area for Lyme disease. There's only 13 states in the country that are considered endemic for Lyme disease. As you can see, by far the majority of them are on the East Coast, including Maine. So here in Maine, we have seen a steady increase in cases of Lyme disease over the last 10 years, um, with the exception of 2010 when case counts dropped dramatically, but they picked up again the next year. And again, in 2015, we had 1,200 cases of Lyme disease reported, which is a de decrease from previous years. Uh, there's a lot of things that can cause the decrease in Lyme disease. Ticks are very susceptible to weather. So if it's a hot, dry summer, there's going to be a lot fewer ticks out. Um, if you remember, 2015 was also a long winter. And so ticks were not coming out as early in the season as they have in other years. And hopefully, some of this decrease is because of prevention that people are more aware and they are taking precautions against beating, getting bitten by ticks. So here in Maine, the cases of Lyme disease have expanded in geography right along with the ticks. So if you look at the map on the left, that's from 2008. And you can see the majority of so the brighter the colors, the yellow is the fewest cases and red is the most cases. So the majority of the cases, the red areas are down in the southern area. And as you can see, going through time, it has expanded. So the Midcoast area tends to have very, very high rates of Lyme disease now. And Lyme disease is moving inwards away from the coast. So there is a seasonality of Lyme disease. Ticks can be out and can be questing any time the temperature is above freezing. Um, they're more likely to be out any time the temperature is above 40 degrees. But by far, the majority of cases are required during the summer months, so June, July, and August. Um, however, we do have cases of Lyme disease reported with symptom onset year rounds. Lyme disease disproportionately affects different age groups. So 
the age group that has the highest rates of Lyme disease is 5 to 14 year olds and the age group that age group that has the second highest rate of Lyme disease is mature adults and that's 65 years and older. Um, so we do special targeting messages to these groups to make sure that they are aware and they're taking precautions. Part of this is possibly due to exposure. Kids are much more likely to be outside and playing and adults over the age of 65 might be retired, they might be out gardening, they might spend more time outside than some of the other age groups. But this is something that's of a concern to us and that, that we're actively working to help reduce those rates in those age groups. So the most common symptom of Lyme disease is the erythema migrans rash. It's estimated to appear in 70 to 80 percent of individuals with Lyme disease, but it is not always reported. So here in Maine, an erythema migrans rash alone is reportable. Um, but we don't get that many reports from physicians alone. So our rates hover around 50% of our cases have a known rash. Uh, we know that to be an underestimation because by far the majority of our cases are reported from lab reports, not from the rash alone. The second most common symptom is arthritis, followed by neurologic, and thankfully the cardiac uh, symptoms are very rare. So treatment, Lyme disease is treatable. The earlier that treatment is started for Lyme disease, the easier it is to treat. So we want people to pay attention to the symptoms and start treatment earlier. If you are bitten by a tick, monitor for signs and symptoms of Lyme disease for 3 to 30 days following the bite. And if you have any of the symptoms or suspect you have any of the symptoms, please follow up with your healthcare provider for treatments. So Lyme disease is not the only tick-borne disease we have here in Maine. It is the most common, but we have several other diseases that are becoming more and more common as time goes on. First up of these is anaplasmosis. Anaplasmosis is also carried by the Ixodes scapularis tick. Again, this is the same tick that can carry Lyme disease. Symptoms can range from mild to severe, mild being mild flu-like illness, again, fever, headaches, body aches, but anaplasmosis can cause severe sequelae including encephalitis and death. Testing for anaplasmosis can be done by polymerase chain reaction. This is our preferred testing method because it is a direct testing method. It is a yes or no answer. Um, with anaplasmosis, the morulae can also be seen in a blood smear, and you can also test for antibodies to anaplasmosis. So anaplasmosis cases have been on the rise here in Maine. Um, our case counts doubled almost every year between 2012 and 2014. They leveled off again in 2015. But again, the cases of anaplasmosis follow those early trends that I showed you for Lyme disease. That the majority of the cases are in the southern counties, but it's becoming more common in the mid-coast areas and it is starting to move inland as well. The next disease is babesiosis. Babesiosis is also carried by the Ixodes scapularis tick. But unlike the other two diseases, babesiosis is actually a parasite. It's not a bacteria. Symptoms of babesiosis include Fatigue, sweating, dark urine, chills, possible anemia. Again, it's fairly vague symptoms, so if you have flu-like symptoms during the summer month, make sure you let your provider know. Testing for babesiosis can also be done by PCR. Again, this is, a, this is our preferred test. It's a yes-no test. That it's looking for the DNA of the parasite itself. Because it's a parasite, it can also be seen on a blood smear, and serology is also available for babesiosis. And again, babesiosis cases have been on the rise. For about the last five years, case counts have increased, including some fairly dramatic jumps. Um, from 2012 to 2013, the case count almost quadrupled. Um, babesiosis is still most common in the southern counties. Again, this is following the same trend that we saw in Lyme disease in, in anaplasmosis, that it comes in in the southern counties first. It works its way up its coast, and then it starts to work inland. So by far, the majority of our cases are still seen in the southern counties, but it, it does appear to be moving north. Next up, we have Powassan. Powassan is another tick-borne disease that is actually a virus. Powassan is considered a very rare disease. Uh, Maine had several cases in the early 2000s, and then we went nine years without a case. And we had confirmed cases in 2013 and again in 2015. Powassan is carried by the Ixodes cookii tick. This is the woodchuck tick. This is very difficult to tell the difference between Ixodes cookii and Ixodes scapularis by the naked eye. Um, there's also a second version of Powassan. It's called the deer tick virus. It's, it's Powassan. It's just a separate strain of it, which can be carried by the deer tick themselves. So 
Poisson um, is, is very rare, but it's something that we're looking out for. And interestingly, Powassan is the only tick-borne arboviral disease, arbo meaning carried by an arthropod and viral meaning that it is a virus. So it's the only tick-borne arboviral disease in the United States and Canada. There are a few other tick-borne diseases that we're keeping our eye out on. First up is Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever is carried by the dog tick, which is the Dermacenter variabilis. We have plenty of this tick here in Maine, but ticks in Maine are not known to be infected. Symptoms of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever include fever, headache, and rash. And testing for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is by serology. Um, PCR is available actually on the skin rash, so it's a little bit harder to do. This is something we're watching out for, but as far as we know right now, ticks in Maine are not infected. Second up is Ehrlichiosis. Ehrlichiosis is carried by the Lone Star Tick, which is uncommon in Maine. You find a couple of them every year, but they may come in on travelers. Um, symptoms include fever, headache, nausea, and body aches. Um, ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis are pretty much impossible to tell apart by symptoms, and they also cross-react in lab tests. So testing by PCR is preferred. Again, that's a yes-no answer. And ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis used to be considered the same disease. It was only in 2008 that anaplasmosis was recognized as a separate disease. So it used to be called human granulocytic ehrlichiosis is now being called anaplasmosis. So those two, two diseases are very close, but ehrlichiosis is not known to be here in Maine because we don't have very many of the tick that carries it. And finally, there's a, a relatively new disease that is making a lot of headlines lately. That is Borrelia miyamotoi. This is a fairly new described tick-borne illness. It is more closely related to the bacteria that causes relapsing fever than it is to Lyme disease, or to Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. It was first identified in ticks in 1995, and then it was first identified in humans in Russia. Um, to date, there have been three known infections in the United States, but there is only one commercial lab that tests for it, and that's Imogen. It's a test, it's a company based out of Boston. So research tests are still in development. Um, commercial tests are very limitedly available, and so we're still learning a lot more about this disease. So what are we going to do to prevent ticks? Um, we like to encourage the no ticks for me approach, so there's four messages to help remember. This is our Lyme Disease Awareness Month poster contest winner from 2015, so this little poster will help you remember how to keep the ticks off. Number one is to wear protective clothing. Uh, ticks need to get to your skin, so if you wear long pants, tuck your pants into your socks, tuck your shirt into your pants, you're not going to give ticks the skin that they need to be able to attach to you. Um, also, if you wear light colored clothing as opposed to dark colored clothing, it makes the ticks easier to see and then easier to get off. Number two is to use an EPA repel EPA approved repellent, and we're going to talk about what those are in a few minutes. but. Make sure that if you are going to be in a tick-infested area that you take po proper precautions, which is the next step. Use caution in tick-infested areas. We talked about what tick-infested areas look like, so if you're going into an area that you know is good habitat for ticks, make sure you're extra cautious when you go in and that you do a very good tick check when you come out, which is number four. Perform daily tick checks. Uh, this is important on both humans and animals. Our animals, our pets, go out outside and they may be exposed to ticks as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about where the, the best places to look for a tick check are here in just a moment. So when you go outside, dress appropriately. Here are the five repellents that are EPA approved. It's a DEET, oil of lemon eucalyptus, IR3535, picaridin, or permethrin. The first four are approved for use on clothing or on skin. The fourth or fifth one, permethrin, is approved for use on clothing. Permethrin is only approved for use on clothing, so you do not want to spray it directly on your skin. Anytime you use repellent, always follow the directions on the back. And after you've worn repellent, thoroughly wash and dry your clothes. Do a daily tick check. We recommend doing this by both sight and by touch. Some of these ticks are very, very small, and so you may not notice them. If you're like me, you might have a lot of freckles on your arms, so I always tell people to get to know your freckles. If your freckle is moving, it is not a freckle. Um, but that's the size that some of these ticks can be. So if you know that you've been in a tick infested area, we recommend that you do a tick check immediately after you leave that area and then again a few hours later. 
And here in Maine, during particularly during spring, summer, and fall, we recommend that you do a daily tick check regardless. Um, and like I said, your pets can go out and they can pick up ticks and they can bring them into your house. So make sure that you do a tick check on your pet as well. Next up, we have a poster that was created by the 4-H kids to help remind you where on your body to check for ticks. So ticks like warm, protected, moist areas. So there are the places that ticks more commonly are found. And that's around the nape of your neck and your hairline, your armpits, your groin, the back of your knees, and around your ankles. These are the ticks where ticks are most likely to be found, but make sure you do a full tick check every day. There are a few things that you can do for your own property to help make your yard safer. If you remove brush and leaf litter and tall grass, that's going to give ticks less places to live. Um, if your property boards up ne borders up next to the woods, if you can create a dry border between your property and the woods, uh, ticks are not going to be able to cross that themselves. So you can see the example in the picture that ticks aren't going to cross that. It's probably rocks on the bottom, rocks, wood chips, anything that um, is drying. Ticks will dry out before they cross that on their own. Um, but as we all know, ticks are not always just crossing on their own. It's small mammals, it's deer, it's other sorts of things that may cross into your yard. So if you have a problem with deer coming into your yard, you can remove plants that attract them and construct physical barriers to keep them from entering your yard. So what if you do what do you do if you find a tick on you? Well, we need to get it off. Tick removal is very important. Um, there are two recommended ways to remove your tick. First up is with a tick spoon. That's a, there's a picture of it down below. A tick spoon is a little plastic spoon that has a notch. So you place the notch near where the tick is, and you apply slight pressure and slide the spoon forward, and it will detach the tick. The other method is with tweezers. So with tweezers, you grasp the tick as close to the skin as possible, and you pull gently straight up until the tick lets go. There's a lot of other home remedies that are recommended or that are supposedly better at getting rid of ticks. Um, things like Vaseline and burning them off. Uh, we don't recommend using any of those. There is the potential to irritate the tick, and the, if the tick gets irritated, they can regurgitate their stomach contents into your skin, which can cause a local uh, reaction in your skin. Um, ticks are also very good at what they do, so they don't have to breathe very often. So if you're trying to smother a tick, it's going to take a long time, and we'd rather you just get that tick off as soon as possible. So after you have found a tick, um, ticks are notoriously hard to kill. The easiest way to do it is to put it in a container of rubbing alcohol. This will also help preserve the tick in case that you want to have it identified. Um, ticks are not going to be killed through the wash cycle of your laundry machine. However, the dryer will kill your ticks. So if you have clothing that you are concerned have might have ticks on them, Put that clothing through the dryer first to kill the ticks, and then put it through the washer to wash those ticks away. Tick identification is available at the University of Maine or no cooperative extension, and this is a free service that they offer. Uh, tick submission forms should accompany it. There's forms and instructions online at their website. Currently, ticks will not be tested for presence of disease. It is only identification of the type of tick and its level of engorgement. Uh, we always recommend that you contact your physician if you need medical advice. Uh, but if you want to submit your tick, submit it in a crush-proof, waterproof container and rubbing alcohol, and they will identify species and degree of engorgement. Again, ticks will not be tested to see if they can carry Lyme or any other pathogen. This is our tick ID poster. This is just a quick snapshot to remind you what you need to know. It has both deer ticks and dog ticks and reminds you how to remove ticks. Uh, these posters are available to order on our website. If you go to maine.gov slash Lyme, on the left-hand navigation page, there's an ordering materials website. And for more information, there are a lot of resources here for you. Maine CDC has a disease reporting and consultation line that's monitored 24 hours a day. Maine Medical Center Research Institute has some tick-borne disease experts that can help answer biology, ecology questions. UMaine Cooperative Extension offer operates the Tick Identification Lab, and there are also several tick experts who work up there. Um, Maine CDC's website has lots of information about Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases, and Maine also has an email address that you can send questions to, which is disease.reporting at maine.gov. This email address is not secure, so please do not send patient names or medical information in this email address. 
That's everything we have for you today. Thank you so much for paying attention and for listening, and we hope you learned something new. Thanks.